Well, welcome. I'm Liz Millman from Learning Links International, and uh, we've got yet another Black History Conversation session today. So I'm just going to share the screen so that we can just uh, have a look at uh, what we're up to and get ourselves started. Um, here we are. Large it up. OK, so we're welcoming Professor Maxine Berg from Warwick University. She's going to be joined. She's joined us already. And we've already had some uh, discussions and got ready uh, to talk about uh, your work, um, Maxine, and the specific interest you have in the work of Eric Williams. And Maxine Berg is, also, is the co-author of the book she wrote with Pat Hudson, Slavery, Capitalism and the Industrial Revolution. And that uh, uh, Pat joined us a couple of weeks ago uh, to talk about the book. So uh, Maxine's coming from a different a different slant. So we also thank everybody who's supported all our past seasons. And also I've put on here, thanks go to Tonson Sango, who I've just spent an hour with, who's volunteered to help take things forward to get our new website sorted. Just wait for this. Going to be good. So uh, that's that's what we're up to today. We're in season 11 and it's number 128. Now I'm in Australia, so the um, uh, way that we work here is to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we're currently living, which I'm currently living, and this is the Wunjiri people of the Kulin Nation. So I pay respects to their elders past, present and future. This land belongs to the sovereign people of the First Nations. It was never ceded. It always was and it always will be Aboriginal land. And I've got the flags of um, the Aboriginal people, the First Nations and um, the Torres Strait Islanders, which is the blue, green and white one. So this um, acknowledgement of country is the way that meetings start, that um, TV programmes start, um, in the shopping centre, there's signs acknowledging the First Nations traditional owners. So despite we had the dreadful upset with the recent referendum, which denied the First Nations people to have a voice to Parliament, the vote was no, another disastrous referendum. Um, yeah, things, things move on and uh, we're getting there. So also we decided that at Black History Conversations needed to acknowledge the injustice of the actions taken by the British and other European countries that invaded and took position, possession of the islands in the Caribbean Sea, as well as the continents of North and South America. And talking about um, the First Nations here in Australia, we had a TV series on recently about the Australian wars, which explain um, so clearly the efforts that the First Nations people had to put into surviving, never mind about uh, overcoming the invasion of the um, of the uh, planters and the prisoners and people that took their lands. So in addition, we also recognise the exploitation of the great continents of Africa, Asia, Australia and many other parts of the world in the centuries of colonialisation and ongoing exploitation. We also acknowledge that this has resulted in the destruction and destabilisation of so many nations, people and cultures. So thank you to Jackie Penn, who was the person who prompted us to also have our own acknowledgement for Black History Conversations. We also recognise that this, year, this is the final year of the International Decade for People of African Descent. So, da 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 da, we have... Professor Sherko Gill, who is the coordinator of the UNESCO International Dialogue and Inquiry and the UNESCO Slave Root Projects Collective Healing Initiative. As part of the international decade, um, she's uh, going to come and talk with us um, the week after next. So that's brilliant, isn't it? So thrilled about that. Okay. So, um, again, the... Uh, we start the sessions just to give some background. I think most of you know about what we're doing. Our working website is blackhistorysongversations.com. Our new website is going to be blackhistoryconversations.org. But there'll be messages on both of them to make sure people land on the right one. So we've introduced ourselves, um, myself, uh, Garrick Prayog, 
uh, June Elizabeth Whitesmith Gully. Sorry, we were doing the introductions before this. I think I spelt your name wrong here, June Elizabeth. Um, and um, Simon Faringo, who also posts the recordings on um, Belong Nottingham's platform at present. Now, I've asked uh, anybody who's joining us, who I haven't got your email address, so I think that's Charlie. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, keep your microphone off unless you're speaking, because it just avoids the feedback. And if there is anything that um, you you find difficult or confrontational, then Garrick Preog or myself, we'd be very happy to talk through any issues offline. Last week, we were delighted to welcome Laura Trevelyan. She's one of the co-founders of Heirs of Slavery. She joined us from New York and she gave a very interesting presentation about the work that she's now doing, um, which is about um, the archives in various Caribbean, supporting the archiving, the protection of materials in archives in various Caribbean countries. Also, uh, to remember that this is Black History Month um, in um, the States, Canada, I think, Canada definitely, and um, also in uh, Jamaica, other countries on that side of the Atlantic. Um, and so um, this is also something to do with reparations. This is an American reparation initiative, so it would be interesting to follow that up at some stage and also to recognise that King Charles supports the study into the British royal family's links. There's one person doing a PhD on it, so I'm sure they're going to discover that the royal family were somewhat involved in the slave trade. Let's uh, wait and see. OK, so now, without any more ado, welcome to Maxine Berg. So that's wonderful, Maxine. I'll just stop sharing for a moment, and then we've got some slides to show to support your talk. So if that's all right. Over to you. So you, uh, this is my symbol. Myself. Yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm delighted to um, join this conversation. I very much enjoyed listening to the last few of them. Now, I am going to say I have not prepared a formal presentation as this is called Black History Conversations, and I'm much more interested in engaging in discussion um, with others. But I just thought um, I'd discuss, I would start out with saying um, how Eric Williams connected uh, with the book that Pat Hudson and I wrote, um, which has a title that includes some of the words of the title of his very famous book, Capitalism and Slavery, which was first published in 1944. And our book is called Slavery, Capitalism and the Industrial Revolution. And in many in addresses, um, in many aspects of it, not totally all of it, but uh, addresses many of the uh, the themes, the issues that he raised all those years ago in 1944. Um, Pat Hudson spoke before about the book, and she did um, say at that time that what drove us to take up this initiative to write this book which actually started first as an attempt to write an article that students and the wider public could read to inform them about the economic benefits that Britain had gained from the slave trade and slave plantations and all the, the shipping, the wider economic aspects of that engagement with slavery. Um, we wanted to write this in wake of the um, both the Black Lives Matter uh, movement after the murder of George Floyd, but certainly after the um, um, the Colston statue, the protests over the Col Colston statue, protests which had been going on for years, but it was only just at that moment in June 2020 where the dramatic um, move was made to just take the statue down and dump it in the harbor. 
so that was what initiated us um, in this this work. So uh, Eric Williams had written this book, but somehow generations of economic and social and also social historians had not been engaging with it. They had not read students, had not read it. It was little discussed in lectures that undergraduates were, um, were having. We ourselves had both taught the Industrial Revolution over years of our careers. And yes, I will speak only for myself. It was um, the, the slavery was certainly discussed, but in, within a wider framework of international trade, it featured maybe as one lecture in a series of 20 lectures at, or two, you know, one or two lectures, not, not a major core part of the um, curriculum in teaching the Industrial Revolution. Now, why had that happened? Eric Williams had made this major intervention in 1944, and somehow we had just kind of lost the thread of that. And it's a story of um, historiography that intrigued both Pat and I very much indeed. Um, we came to write this book with um, what we regarded then as new frameworks that we would look at the what we had learned out of the historical debates on the history of consumption we would set this work in a global history framework. There has been, um, well, it's nearly 20 years now of great interest in global history. And we would connect this with the discussion of capitalism, which is a great new interest among historians now. Uh, so we wanted to, to bring these new, ways of looking at Britain's past um, together in writing this book. But these were very much the themes of Eric Williams back in 1944. Um, now, uh, certainly we, we addressed, um, I, I mean, I don't know, Liz, if you would like to put up the, just a reminder for people, or maybe people who were not at the session that Pat did, that just to show what the um, the motivations for writing the book. Well, there's Eric Williams, right. his favorite um, book. Do you want me to go down to that first? Yeah, I can do maybe that. You could go down to that first. Yeah. Hang on one moment. moment. Let me just, just um, remind talk myself about. about about the chapters and also about the key findings of our yeah. book. And then I'll go back to Eric Williams in all of this. Right. Uh, okay, I'm just uh, coming round to this. Sorry about yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, that's um, it's absolutely Here we are. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here's the book then. Yes, and, there's the um, book. And there's where you can order it with a discount for a few weeks. I think that discount right. will disappear after a few weeks. So maybe we can put that up again at the end. Yeah, yeah. Just, we'll put uh, that on there, yeah. If you just go on to the next slide, then right, okay. um I'll stop doing the alterations. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. And it's just these we wanted to, it was really important. We wanted wanted to do in many ways what Eric <laughs> Williams had done to extend this into a debate over the broad economy, a, a broad approach to this, um, a very much this broader perspective. We did think that the whole debate, the response to Eric Williams had been focused on some very narrow, um, in, in many senses, misconceptions of his, um, of his work. So the chapter titles are up there again. We went through um, the the historiography of this, the um, 
the way that people had mismeasured the contributions of slavery and slave plantations over those generations since Eric Williams wrote his book. Um, we had, uh, we discussed um, the, the really significant role of sugar and the place of that in that wider consumer culture and the great um, enormous amount of works that have been done on the history of consumption in recent decades. Uh, we looked at plantations, we looked at um, plantation agriculture, we set that as a part of British agriculture. It's never considered in discussions of British agricultural development, what, what was happening in the West Indies and what that plantation agriculture was all about. And we went into discussions of the industries. Um, many, uh, these are all mentioned, um, discussed briefly uh, in Williams's Capitalism and Slavery. Uh, we looked at the port, not just the ports, he discusses the ports, but we pushed widely into the hinterlands of those ports. And very significantly, we focused, um, we have an, in, a really important chapter in this book on financial capitalism, on the role of all those aspects of financial instruments, um, like bills of exchange, the role of credit, all sorts of um, financial um, mortgages, uh, insurance, mar especially mar maritime insurance, very much this whole aspect that has made um, it's a central part of British economic development. And um, we do, like he did in his book, um, but we press this further, um, look at the, the period after the abolition of slavery on the plantations and what that meant for wider leg and the wider legacies of slavery. Now, um, I, I, it, as Pat also um, emphasized, we have been able to draw on new data sets, such as the slave voyages um, data set and the legacies of slave ownership dev, um, data set, which Williams didn't have access to any of that enormous new data. There has been a great deal of new work done on slavery, aspects of slavery, but it has been all in specialist journals or divided off from British history, part of Caribbean history, but British historians don't read it, and all dispersed. And so it was important to bring this new work together and to combine it with rich material in much of the older work that was done on, in, on trade and on slavery, um, reaching right back from, you know, sometimes before in, at times in the period before Williams was writing, historians doing a lot of this work, but it had been marginalized, pushed aside. Uh, and there was enormous rich material in that. So that's, um, that's, we, we came to that and we wrote this really, well, I thought it was a very, really revealing chapter, which we called Misguided Measures. And that's where we came to address what happened to this key work of Eric Williams. And we were able to trace, uh, you know, these generations of his economic historians who had narrowed our field, um, they had narrowed our field and they had turned the focus of it away from world global factors, from the significance of, of trade 
and turned it in, inward to domestic and indig well, um, endogenous, domestic endogenous um, factors of economic growth, agriculture, population growth, capital formation, um, uh, technological change, all of those just considered as somehow uh, a creation within Britain itself. Um, and it really, there, there was that whole trend within the field. And alongside of that, whenever there was, there was often debate over what Eric Williams had argued, because there was this fundamental thesis that he set forward of the triangular trade. And everybody, you know, it's taught in schools. Everybody had heard of the triangular trade. But the key thing was to demonstrate that it was wrong, that, um, that the profits generated from the slave trade were it was argued the profits generated by the slave trade really did not make a very significant contribution to capital formation in Britain at that time in any specific industries or in um, for the economy as a whole. Indeed, it was estimated that the most that might have been contributed by slavery was about 1% of GDP. It was, and this figure kept rearing its head right up until, until 1998. Um, so there's, uh, it was, um, this was something we really needed to address, to kick back against, to look at this data, to see, um, you know, where that had gone. Now, there had certainly been debate about this. Um, let us look at the work of Barbara Solo. I think that she did extraordinary work, especially through the 1980s, to, um, to challenge this, to produce new estimates, and to push the to push forward again the significance of those the case that that had been made by Eric Williams, she um she organized uh, co-organized con um, made uh, there was a major conference I think um I think there was a volume in eight uh, nineteen eighty seven that came out of it. Uh, she organized this with Stanley Engerman who had was one of those I think who produced the one percent figures figure. Uh, there was a lot of um, debate and there were conferences going on, but she's the key figure, really raising the challenge to the predominant view of the, of the field at the time that slavery was a minor consideration. Uh, so I do want, I would love to know more about Barbara Solo. Uh, so, so let's go back to Eric Williams himself. What happened, I mean, we, we have, um, uh, we set out his arguments in the book. We, um, we look at all these attempts to produce measures to prove him wrong. And we show the great problems with those measures and come back really in great support of many of his findings, not all of them, certainly not all of them, but great support of that. But um, there is Eric Williams himself and this, um, our interest, I should say the interest of both of us in him was partly was also sparked by the possibility or the the prompting, um, I think prompting especially by Pat that we needed to have a book launch. Uh, it was far too expensive to organize a book launch in London. Nobody was going to produce the funding that 
is now required to hold any event like that. Uh, so another possibility was Oxford, where I live. Um, I'm just going to say this. Pat said to me, aristocratic. <laughs> so I had the brilliant idea of St. Catherine's College, where Williams was a student in the 1930s. And so we both, um, I was here in Oxford, so I could go to the archives. Pat did a lot of other wider reading of his own texts, etc. And we, um, we put together a small exhibition that we would, we held at St. Catherine's College to coincide with our book launch. And this was about the life of Eric Williams in Oxford during the 1930s. Um, I think there's an image of our little, of our little book, um, exhibition. Um, you'll see, yes, if you go down the next slide, you'll see some of it. And there's the, there's a few other slides that show, if you follow, you can follow on to a few other slides, which so show part of this. Um, you can see from it, he was, um, books that were from his supervisor, some of his work, but also his books, um, of his supervisor and, his examiner. Uh, so I'll say something more about them. Um, not sure about the the one following. Um, we'll come back to these. I think these. Uh, there's a. The, I don't know if any of this can be blown up, Liz. Um, yeah. There's at right this. Yes, there's that one. But right beside it, there's a picture of him in his football team. Uh, yes. Okay. Well. Let's let me tell you a little about Eric Williams in his um his formative at his formative stages. Uh, of course, he was um he was born and and brought up in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, and he speaks in his um his autobiography Inward Hunger about those early days when. Um, he was one of, well, there had been 12 children born in the family. Uh, one died some months after birth. Uh, so there was a large family. His father was employed in the post office at a very low salary and took on auditing for friendly societies to raise some extra money. His mother um, bade um, apart from looking after all these children, baked cakes for sale that she would and other bakery goods that she sold uh, to gain a little extra money. So it was, and he had a deeply, his father was deeply frustrated in his own, that he wasn't able to gain um, any career advancement. Uh, so there was a great focus on this bright child they had that um, one of, I'm not sure if he was actually the oldest, but um, uh, I think he likely was, but great focus on his education. Uh, so he, um, he is schooled in the very British curriculum of the, um, the, the island uh, the and is able to not not just schooled in this I mean all the subject areas were high British education subject areas lots of Latin Greek um, other well he learned uh, French and Spanish as well and he gains the island island scholarship to go to Britain. And this is a great high point in his father's life that his son had won the island scholarship to go to Oxford. Um, so, yes, so here you see, you can see in some of these images, he is um, this young, young lad 
uh, in his get, getting his first degree in Oxford and then um, his PhD uh, some years later. Well, the college he went to, St. Cat, it was the St. Catherine Society, and there's an image up in the um, just up the top there. There's some old buildings on a great uh, black and white photograph. Yes, that was the building of the St. Catherine Society. It's now the music faculty in Oxford, and so not very big, quite small. Nobody could live there. Very few people. I don't. Maybe a few tutors lived there or something. Oh, really? Um. But it was it was very um, they were all sent out to be lodgers and these they had these society, a few of these societies in, in Oxford um, and they were especially for uh, boys, um, in this case, boys who could not afford the accommodation fees of a traditional Oxford college. So he was sent out just to be to be a lodger and. But he took a great part in the college life. He was one of the leading uh, members of the football team and the cricket team. He was a very, very accomplished uh, sportsman um, and took great part also in the College History Society. It was called the Dean's Kitchen Society. And uh, there were and the debating society, the college debating society. And even at this very early stage as an undergraduate, he was um, presenting debating, debating presentations. He was writing essays for essay competitions, etc., on issues of race and inequality and the history of the Caribbean. So um, this was a really major, uh, major thing for him. Um, so he writes his, um, he gets through his undergraduate degree coming out the top first, uh, top two people who got first class degrees in history in that year. He applied for a fellowship at All Souls, but he didn't get it. That was the only paid fellowship for postgraduate work at that time um, that would pay all your provide your accommodation and pay your ex your living expenses over the period of doing a research degree um, or in a, another undergraduate degree which which he tried he started with first um, and he made quite a you know he he did say no native, however the trial line, would fit socially into all... Maxine, um, I can't hear you too well. Oh, okay. Um, I'll bring okay. it a bit closer. Um, he said, he wrote um, afterwards, he said that no native, however detribalized, could fit socially into all souls. Can you hear me now? Yes, fine, thank you. Oh, that was, and he found, had great difficulty finding any funding to help him to be able to carry on with, um, with historical research. So eventually he got another Sellers um, Fellowship uh, from the growth of the, one of these um, uh, guilds, uh, one of these London guilds, the leather sellers, and they had a small scholarship. And he pressed the university for a uh, university studentship, also accusing the university of um, racial discrimination. So he did get one and was able to carry on with his research. Uh, and he um, he eventually graduates in uh, 1938 with a, a PhD thesis called The Economic Aspect of the Abolition of the Slave Trade and West Indian Slavery. His supervisor for that was Vincent Todd Harlow, um, who was the Bight Lecturer at that time at Balliol College, the Bight Lecturer in, in Imperial History. And 
had written a number of, of books on the history of empire, but significantly had also written several books on the West Indies, on the his, this, especially the 17th century history of Barbados. Um, so he was, um, he did have supervision from somebody who knew something of his field and his interests. Uh, his examiner though, was Reginald Coupland, who became the Bite Professor of um, Imperial History, uh, but stayed at All Souls, where he already was. Um, Reginald Coupland was another matter. He had been a member of Lionel Curtis's Round Table. He was very much a contributor to Imperial policy at the time. And he hadn't written a great deal, unlike Vincent um, Todd Harlow, but he had written on the abolition movement and then wrote a biography of Wilberforce. And you see, this was a big problem for Eric Williams, whose thesis argued that the abolition of the slave trade was due to economic factors, not to the great humanitarian gesture of the British. Uh, so he had to, um, one of the things that, that um, Todd Harlow um, did say to him, uh, and there's a letter that Harlow wrote to him before he submitted his thesis. He said, to him, you must endeavor to understand the tremendous dynamic force of the evangelical revival. It is not merely a question of accepting their sincerity, but of getting into their skin. If you fail to do that, your economic facts, however true to themselves, will not secure for you the d degree. So his supervisor was doing what all good supervisors do. They're, you know, the point of a supervisor is to get their, uh, well, it is to, um, to advise and, you know, help in the um, uh, suggesting materials, directions, reading, um, work, etc. But it is also to make sure your student gets through that viver and gets their PhD, their DPhil, whatever. So this is what Vincent Todd Harlow was doing here. He knew that the, the examiner would have to be Reginald Coupland and Reginald Coupland would find it totally unacceptable. Um, so Williams did temper down some of the argument, the, the very boldness of the argument he was stating there. And he got his DPhil. But what happens after the DPhil? Well, he couldn't get a position anywhere. Um, and he left Oxford and took up a position in 1939 at Howard University in Washington. Um, it was a very, a very good university teaching people from all ethnic and religious backgrounds and was became known as the, the Black Oxford. And he taught there for several years. And during that time, he wrote his book, Capitalism and Slavery. Now, the book is different than his PhD thesis. It draws on some of the material from his PhD thesis, but it is different. It gained from other influences that he had in the... Um, in the background, in the, the context he now was in Howard University with a lot of anti-colonial uh, debate and discussion, uh, a, lot of, um, a lot on racial inequality, a lot of discussion on that. He was also very influenced by older friends that he had, C.L.R. James, who wrote Black Jac Jacobins, George um, Padmore, and um, Lowell Ragatz, um, who had written an important book for, for him, uh, published 
um, some um, in the late twenties, a book called The Fall of the Planter Class in the British Caribbean. So those were great influences on him when he came to write uh, Capitalism and Slavery. But he, he writes this book, which is about the connections between the Caribbean, between the, the, um, the Caribbean and Britain. It is a book which is, which is about that connection. It is a book about British economic development and he could not find a publisher in Britain. Um, what can I, it was a disgrace. It was a complete disgrace. No, he said at the time, nobody would buy. Um, a radical publisher at that time, uh, Warburg said, um, he said at the time, I'm losing you again. Okay, I'm just sorry. Um, the pub, one of the publishers he sent it to, um, uh, um, said, uh, Warburg. He said the work. Um, yes, the uh, he said, how could we? Um, yes, he was known as a revolutionary publisher, uh, Warburg, uh, Frederick Warburg at the time. He said. Mr. Williams, are you trying to tell me that the slave trade and slavery were abolished for economic and not for, for humanitarian reasons? I would never publish such a book, for it would be contrary to the British tradition. So there it is. It gets published by uh, University of um, North Carolina Press in 1944, and it takes another 20 years before it gets published in Britain by a small British publisher, Andrew, Andre Deutsch. And that was how it remained. Uh, not widely available. Um, this, so you had to get it from the library and uh, there it was um, not widely available some years after it had been a small publisher until 2021 when it becomes a Penguin modern classic. It's a classic now. So we have it as the um, the uh, the new, and it broke the boundaries of um, Penguin sales uh, way above any other book that they were selling in the, in those months after it was published. Um, so that's. You know, that's the sad story that we have coming out of this extraordinary um, person and, um, you know, extraordinary historian. Well, he didn't stay a historian. Well, he did stay a historian because he continued to write um, other books, uh, other, other things, but he turned to politics. He returned... Um, he was um, part of the Anglo-American um, Commission, Caribbean Commission. And he joins that in 1948 uh, and returned to the Caribbean to work with that for some years. Um, and then becomes very involved in um, politics in Trinidad, uh, in Trinidad, and became very well known for a for a famous uh, um, a very famous lecture that he gave that ten thousand people attended uh, in Woodford Square, and after that, over a hundred lectures that he gave in something that became known as the University of Woodford Square. So he just got out there and started to talk and he gave extraordinary numbers of world history lectures for all and sundry to come along to. It was amazing. Um, and then goes into starts the um, uh, the the political party that he became identified with and soon becomes the um, the first prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago and leads it to um, leads it to independence. 
in 1962. So there he is, he becomes this politician and he returns to Oxford in 1964 to open the new buildings of St. Catherine's College together with Sir Alan Bullock, the, um, the president of the college and um, Harold Macmillan who was the chancellor of the university at that time. And the university gave him an honorary degree in 1965. Um, when we held our book launch, Erica Williams Connell, the daughter of um, Eric Williams, uh, spoke from the Eric Williams Memorial Collections. And there was a video link and she gave a talk um, welcoming our book and we're very grateful for that so here's it's just an image of her speaking here when we we did that i think i'm just going to stop talking there and i'd really love to have some um discussion and questions thank you well thank you so much that was just brilliant <laughs> wow um thank you thank you thank you now I can usually ask the first questions, but I'm not going to. I'm going to see what other questions we've got or other points that people have got that they'd like to raise. We've been joined by Lisa Gabbert, and um, uh, she's joining us from the southern states, um, Houston, I think. So that's lovely. And uh, Simon has to leave us now, but he leaves his picture on so that the, the recording carries on. Thanks, Simon, very much indeed. OK, then. So... Um, Oh, gosh, what points do you want to pick up on? I was fascinated to to hear all of this. Garrick, thank you. There's so much information, uh, Maxine, that you've presented to us. Um, it's not a direct question, but maybe to, to add to um, your research around um, Eric Phillips. Um, I was very privileged yeah. to... Um, serve as an apprentice under Darkus Howe. Um, uh -huh. No, Darkus Howe, when I was um, a young man in 1971, part of the Black Power movement in Brixton, um, I served with Darkus Howe for a number of years, um, also with um, Olive Morris um, mm -hmm. campaigning for, for, for better housing. And it was Darkus Howe that I first heard about Eric Williams in conversation, yes. um, because that was one of his sort of mentor. Yes, very good, very interesting, yes. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Okay, so Robert Moore, you're next. Thanks, yeah. Garrick. Yes, it's interesting. I mean, when I was a student in the, uh, when was it? The early 1960s. Eric Williams was certainly mentioned, but of course his work wasn't readily accessible. And we mm. spent a lot more, that was because working with Peter Worsley, mm. who introduced the term third world to yeah. the English speaking world. Um, we spent a lot more time on Oliver Cromwell Cox. <laughs> um, which was uh, good knockabout stuff, I have to say. Yeah. But what was inter what is particularly interesting is this kind of gap in the middle, because yeah. in the night, late sixties and the seventies, we were talking about the development of underdevelopment, uh, the work of uh, Andre Gunda Frank, yes. Regis yes. Debray, and others, yes. and. Here we were clearly linking Western capitalist exploitation of the third world to the third world and looking at the way in which the structures of the third world countries were being distorted and the role of the comprador bourgeoisie and, and all of this. But there wasn't that the Industrial Revolution had been discussed rather as Maxine said, it, it, it was just sort of something that was British. I think what, what came up quite interestingly, once we started talking about the development of underdevelopment, 
And having been schooled in the, in the work of Oliver Cromwell Cox and similar writers, was the question of where did the British working class end? In other words, did the British working class actually include, or could it be said to include, all the people who were being exploited in uh, overseas territories to the great enrichment of corporations and individuals in Western Europe and, and North America? Uh, now, of course, that that question then got uh, sidelined into discussions of race and the relationship between race and class. So perhaps I should just leave those comments there. But can I just say about Oxford? Oxford was an absolute backwater. And to many, in many ways, it still is, I think. But... Um, <laughs> In the 1960s, we had all the debates about immigration. There was Enoch Powell on the rampage. There were all those dreadful uh, Conservative Party right-wingers and so on, going on and on. And small groups of us were trying to establish race relations work in universities against very stiff opposition. Oxford had a chair of race relations. And the holder of that chair made absolutely no contribution whatsoever to any of these debates. His sole interest was in the workers in the copper belt of what was then Rhodesia, mm. where he appeared to be working on behalf of the mining companies. Oh. So Oxford had a chair of race relations, which made zero contribution to any of these intellectual developments in the 1960s and 70s. I should say I was in Oxford in the 1970s. Um, I went to teach at Warwick in 1978. I had come to Oxford from um, Canada. so. Uh, but even from that period, about 1973, I, I do recall going to social history and radical history um, work, uh, events. This turned into the history workshop movement in the later 1970s and the 1980s. And that was really formative to what happened to eventually what happened to history. And that did take place in Oxford. And it was because of Ruskin, it wasn't any of the rest of the university, it was Ruskin College and Raphael Samuel and the um, his students and others who had taken part of that. But it became very, very um, significant. But I think you there is another side of this. So much of that history of the English working class, well, too much of it was, of it was about the English. What about the Scots and the Welsh and the Irish? Um, yes, it did not look outside to connections um, to all the, the coerced and um, very extremely low paid work forces in the British Empire and before that, the colonial territories. So we get E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class, so formative in social history over this um, period. And all these younger historians focusing on these English, English themes. And um, so there's, you know, there there became a divide between those who did Caribbean history, um, a Latin American history. Uh, so these area studies, people were, they were, they did, you know, this happened somewhere else. It wasn't Britain's problem. So again, <laughs> even in radical 
social history, this was a big, it's a, it was a big problem. It's not just the economic historians that were at fault here. It was also the social historians. Very interesting. I think that that was a, a great way of responding. Thanks, Maxine. Now we've got Dr. Vivian Crawford here. Dr. Vivian Crawford's mm -hmm. relatively recently retired as executive director of the prestigious Institute of Jamaica. So uh, over to you, Vivian. Wow. Thank you, Liz. Hi, Professor. Maxine. Oi, my heart full. <laughs> I want to thank you, Prof, for the presentation because I went to university in the 60s. I, one of the modules was Modern Political Thought. And I had the shocker when we read Capitalism and Slavery mm. because we grew up, although I am a generation of people called Maroons, where we broke our yeah. agreement 1739, but we grew up hearing that it was Queen Victoria who set us free. And in fact, there's a popular folk song, Jubilee, Jubilee, Queen Victoria set me free, etc. So when I read Capitalism and Slavery, I now realize that had that book been published in England and not in the United States, you said it was published in the United States? Yes, it was first published in the United States he would have gone to prison because mm. in Jamaica in 1944, there was a gentleman, Roger Mays. Mm. Roger Mays, he was sent to prison for sedition for an article that he wrote in a newspaper entitled, Now We Know. Ah. He was sent to prison. Now we know. And what your presentation is evoking my curiosity because you said that um, 1% um, sugar was 1% of GDP. So um, the inquiring mind in me is asking, if it, is, what, if it was 1% of GDP, what would have led so many people to be in the business and so many people to be brutalizing the human race. Perhaps it needs no answer. Let us just leave it at that. This well, is, yes, it is extraordinary that economic historians felt comfortable to be able to make those statements um, on their the basis of their very inadequate data uh, at that time. Um, now, we have discussed in the book different estimates that might have been made to that, um, uh, to, to that. One of the points that Barbara Solo made, she estimated, she did an estimate of the contributions to industrial capital so if we just look at industrial capital, and she estimated this was closer to 40%. The contribution of earnings of um, earnings from slavery and slave plantations and the slave trade, not just the slave trade. We are looking, she was looking at this, she even at that point time was the looking package, at this. The package. Yes, the, entire package. The, the whole package. And um, but that is to the contribution to industrial industrial capital. Um, now, there is the wider economy, but even so. The the difference is huge. Now, few now would try to make that kind of estimate. There are just so many pitfalls in trying, in dealing with the data. The data is much greater now. Um, but I would say that one of the things that is, is really striking, and especially for teaching now, is the legacies of slavery project, of slave ownership at UCL, 
they have this wonderful map um, where you can just all these dots right around the country where um, pe people gained some comp they claimed compensation sometimes for on for ownership of one enslaved person and they had never been to the West Indies they had no very little it was just part of their legacy or part of um you know they'd been left this in some way but it's just the wide breadth of the country that we see that was affected and that gained from this um so that was quite um it's it's such a wonderful um map and that you can follow the stories of those people who made those gains. Well, Prof, you are terrific. <laughs> You're just evoking, evoking. <laughs> like, so and I beg Liz and the audience, I beg you two seconds to share with you what is perhaps a humorous story. At the university, we understand that for his dissertation at Oxford, the professor asked, why would you be taking on such a topic? Hmm. And his response was, those who feel it know it. Hmm. Now, that, that comment that he made, Jamaicans in your audience would know a story analogous to the Jamaican education system. Hmm. It was brutal in colonial times. Children were beaten, oh God of grace. We were flogged with switches. A question asked you do not know, hell broke loose. And there is a story told at the time in Jamaica when teachers were paid. You were paid according to the standard performance that was in the school. And an inspector went to a school and ask the question, who is the son of God? And nobody answered. And the teacher, the teacher was devastated. So he, wa he was at the back of the room and he pinched a boy on his ears for not knowing. And when the pain went through the child, he, he called out. In Jamaica, they would say, ball out. He called out, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and the inspector said, excellent. <laughs> excellent. Brilliant. <laughs> How did you know that? And the boy <laughs> said, those who feel it know it. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you so much for yet again lightening the whole <laughs> the whole thing. Gosh, that's a fantastic story. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Vivian. All oh, right, okay, Rose, you're going to uh, uh, ask now. I'll contribute. It's it's a quick one, um, uh, Professor. <clears throat> it, it it occurred to me as you were journeying through your book and um, commenting on Eric Williams and the significance of, of his work, I, it, it did one, I did wonder to what extent people have accepted this link now. I'm not, you know, I, 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 I mean, I can see us all nodding and, you know, we're, we're saying, and it is a, um, a wonderful um uh, commentary on on that significant the significant contribution made to um the economy of this country and others but I, I i'm questioning in my own mind whether there is broad acceptance of of this now in 2024 and i i i would hazard a guess that there really isn't that yeah. at the intellectual you know at the sort of academic level and 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 lo lots of sort of activist level but i'm not sure and i wondered whether you you could comment you know tell us a little bit about what you feel about this well i have made presentations um and i've heard presentations in um amongst audiences of economic historians 
and Pat and I together have made presentations. Um, one of the things that is very interesting in response, um, uh, well, I should say responses of those who, some of our, you know, very much esteemed economic historians, we have Robert Allen, for instance, um, I I think it was during COVID because it was an online seminar that was taking place and a student asked him, what about the role of slavery in this story of the Industrial Revolution you're telling? And he said to him, Atlantic trade mattered, but not slavery. Now, it's just totally inconsistent. Um, because, and, and we went to some lengths in our book, but Eric Williams set that out too, very clearly. Uh, the, there is an enormous increase in trade to the North American colonies through the later 18th century and e after the American, the American Revolution is a brief disruption in that. Um, because there's enormous expansion of trade of British manufacturers to the uh, to the new American Republic after the revolution as well. But the money to buy those British manufacturers was gained in that trade with the West Indies. And the West Indies provided all the sugar for the sugar consumption and especially the rum consumption in the, and the, all the distilling, et cetera, that took place in those North American colonies from quite an early stage. Uh, so there was, it was, I mean, William set it out. I mean, it's part of his story of the triangular trade, but somehow that link with the West Indies has been cut off by um, the mainstream of economic historians. So they will acknowledge the role of the Atlantic trade and the market from the, ex the export market for British manufacturers in the North American colonies. Because we have to remember these, there was enormous population growth in these colonies, very, very rapid. And a lot there, there were a lot of um, middling class, um, higher artisan, middling class uh, settlers in these colonies, they wanted the latest new consumer goods. They didn't want um, homespun. They didn't, I mean, despite the story that, um, you know, there's so much uh, freight, you know, so much of American, early American history is freighted with this whole story of the importance of homespun. They wanted the latest fashionable goods that came from Britain. And so they had they had to earn the money to, to buy it. And that money was earned off the, the participation of they themselves in the slave trade, but also that trade in goods of their um, foodstuffs, their um, um, all sorts of, raw materials uh, that they could could offer from the northern colonies um, that they trade in exchange for sugar and um, and cash and, and, and silver that they can buy um, so that they can buy British goods. So it's, you know, you cannot say it's just so inconsistent to say, yes, the Atlantic economy, but not slavery. And I'm afraid it is a view that continues to prevail. Well, we can uh, only, only carry on. Uh, Rose, come back to us if you want. Do you want to? I, I, I just wanted to say it's an inconvenient truth, it seems to me. You know, it's just a um, the the look at the work that's being done um, around the great houses across the country and you've mentioned the map and you know 
the fact is we were paying compensation right up to 2015, I think it was. I mean, what what is it we don't get about the backs of slave, you know, of slaves having contributed economically to the riches um, of huge numbers of people yes. and the country as a whole. Um, and I, I, yeah, you know, just, it, it's just shocking. Doing, yes, just to intervene, it's not compensation that was being paid off in 2015. It was paying off the debt. Right. It was yeah. the debt that, because yeah. um, the, the British had taken out a huge loan in order to make those um uh a european loan to make those compensation payments and sorry and and and, and just the link therefore so, yes. so i mean i was paying my taxes to pay off the debt and i mean i just find that i, I have to say it, very hard to swallow but swallow it i have had to so you know and thousands millions of people in in doing that but thank you so much. It's really helpful. And I'm going to try and get my 30% off <laughs> the book if I can be quick. Yes. <laughs> all yes. right, that sounds well, really good. Well, I think the, the key thing is that we are all aware of what we owe um, or that we were paying taxes for. This is that it is we, we need to, to have this... Um, well known across our society um so that's i think that that i hope that message will get out from our book well um, i have to say garrick over to you next but the book is um it looks so serious but it's actually so readable and i i don't find many academic books very readable I find they make me go to sleep. Um, but I have to say, this was riveting. And it has the best index and the best referencing that you could really hope for. It, it really is is a, a groundbreaking book. And Maxine, one of the things that we're looking at with our website, I don't know if you think about this, it's a bit complex, but we're thinking of the possibility of creating some online courses and this book would translate into an online course so easily. It, it's really excellent. So I'm just bigging it up there. Okay. I have a copy here in Australia sent to me by Pat. I'm very grateful. Okay. Gary. Yeah. The, um, the chapters are all very short. Yeah. They, they can be Wonderful. read at one sitting. You sit down for yeah. an hour and you've done a chapter. So. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> Readable. Okay. Well, just a, just a couple of points. Um, it, it is true. I mean, Robert has put the uh, the largest sum borrowed for in history um, to pay off this debt, and David Cameron was the last individual uh, to receive his payment. Um, but I was just thinking, in terms of when I read certain publication, I often find how the writer tried to conceal um, certain factual information. And a couple of examples of this is, you know, um, slave owners who had plantation and slaves um, often referred to as, you know, traders. Um, merchants, you know, just to avoid, you know, that 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 term, and you know, um, and you made the point, uh, uh, you know, with regards to this constant denial. It's been going on for centuries, where you know we we almost um, take um, the truth and turn it round into a lie. Um, as as Trump says, fake news. So it's literally, you know, you don't know what to believe because this is the way that they, they try to manipulate the truth. And, you know, it, it's very challenging. I think for writers, it's important when you come across that to, to call it out as it is because people need to know. Don't try and conceal and cover it over to make it look all wonderful. 
I think it was Rose, you said, so what is it that we still don't get? Yeah. And and it's it's really hard. I, I spoke earlier when I introduced the fact I was speaking from Australia and I said about the referendum. The reason I think that one of the reasons that it was overturned was that there was a slogan, if you don't know, vote no. Mm -hmm. And you have to vote by law here, otherwise you're fined. Yeah. Um, so it it just swung it so much for people because they 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 just still don't get it. Yeah. They feel they don't know, and it seems as if there isn't plenty of information about. But uh, yeah, well, thank you, everybody. Okay, Robert Moore says when you visit a stately home, you should <laughs> always ask who was robbed to build this. It goes down yeah. a tree. Mm, yes, yeah. yeah. And yeah. also says it was the uh, largest loan ever taken out by the British government. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. uh, interesting yeah. as well. And I think the National Trust do pussyfoot around it and provide cream teas and uh, yeah. cups of tea um, and don't want to upset the punters. But, um, you know, a bit more honesty and a bit less veiled yeah. truths. I can refer to um, yeah. Penryn Castle here, yeah. where they had a they've had several artistic displays there, and um, they um, are you all right, June Elizabeth? Yeah, um, several uh, displays there where it's really been you know you'd have to know your history to understand yeah. what it is they're trying to portray i mean okay a castle made of sugar was one of the things that they had on display and you could understand that but it still requires knowledge so really interesting folks that's wonderful and we've taken so much of your time maxine but we're so grateful and hope you. that you'll stay in touch with us because yeah. we are um meandering our way through these difficult, difficult stories, trying to, um, you know, find out more. And each time, each of us learns that bit more. And I certainly have learned an awful lot from your talk today. And I thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, everyone. And now I'm going to Bye. just play a short um, video now, if that's all right, that Bunmi, uh, Dr. Bunmi Olison, who's um, Nigerian based in Canada from Sankova um, uh, Productions, she's um, done a short video about Black History Month in Canada. So if I can sort the technology, bear with me, it takes four minutes, but it's uh, fascinating. Right, off we go. Now, can you A, see it, and B, hear it? Can't hear we it. We can what? see it, but we can't hear it. Mm. Can you hear it now? A testament to the impact. Yes. It is quite yes. difficult. Yes. Yeah. Of our Pan African series. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee. Oh, so we'll buy you a cup of coffee, Bunny. Subscribe and please turn on your notification buttons to know when we have new episodes. So you can find this on YouTube. .com for history, Afrocentric stories, and other resources for children. After the early settlers, like the first known Africa, to reach Canada, Mathieu da Costa. France authorized the enslavement of Pawnee Native Americans and Africans in New France in 1689, a fact which we are often too eager to overlook. Enslaved Africans were also brought by New Englanders and from the West Indies. By the 1700s, people of African descent were already settled in Nova Scotia. Even after New France was ceded to Britain in 1760, Black and Pawnee people remained enslaved. However, after 1763, many black migrants came as fugitives from American enslavement. After the American Revolution, about 2,000 enslaved black people came with the loyalists to British North America, as Canada was known at the time, alongside 3,500 towered free black loyalists. Despite facing discrimination and poor living conditions, black loyalists established settlements in Nova Scotia and by 1793, the anti-slavery movement in Canada gained momentum with Louis Cooley's resistance in Upper Canada, inciting subsequent legislative actions. Loyalists helped shift societal attitudes, leading to the gradual
the decline of enslavement in Canada. Upper Canada initiated laws for gradual abolition in 1793, with Lower Canada following suit after judicial decisions freed runaway slaves. Although the British Empire did not abolish the slave trade until 1807, black communities grew across Canada and approximately 30,000 black people arrived via the Underground Railroad between 1800 and 1865. Slavery itself was only abolished in the British Empire, including Canada, in 1839. But only two years later, the 1850 saw the founding of abolitionist newspapers by Black Canadians. These papers, like the Provincial Free Bank, established in 1853 by Mary Ann Shad Carey, advocated equality, integration, and self education for Black people in Canada and the United States. The 1800s continued to see an influx of black people who moved to British Columbia and Alberta, facing challenges, including attempts to limit black immigration. Following emancipation, many African Americans returned to the US, but others came to Canada for work, especially in the real industry. Segregated black communities formed on the outskirts of white towns, and self-sufficient black settlements continued to develop against all odds. Early black Canadians often faced poverty and discrimination. Education for black Canadians was unequal and segregated, and while some progress was made in politics, legal inequalities persisted. These challenges only strengthened them and the 20th century saw the growth of black communities and organizations in Canada, shaping their unique identities and contributing to Canadian society as immigration policies became more inclusive. People of African descent have contributed significantly towards building the nation. People like Dr. Anderson Ruffin Abbott, who attended to Abe Lincoln on his deathbed, William Peyton Hubbard, a city of Toronto alderman from 1894 to 1940. Historical landmarks stand tall, echoing the tales of their perseverance. Their importance is magnified by the plethora of notable figures that arose from these communities. Figures like Lincoln Alexander, the first black member of parliament, and Viola Desmond, a courageous civil rights activist who blazed trails across numerous domains initiating change and progression. It is a time to reflect on the struggles and achievements of Black Canadians throughout history, a time to recognize and honor some of the most inspiring events in human history, like the Underground Railroad and the 1969 student protests. These stories deserve to be heard and celebrated. Black History Month is a period where we acknowledge the trials tribulations and tenacity of an entire community that has fought for their rights. One that has been shaped by the resilience of activists like Rosemary Brown, the first black woman to be elected to the provincial legislature in Canada. This month is a testament not only to their unyielding strength, but to the vibrant cultural richness of figures like Michael John former Governor General of Canada and influential author Austin Clark. Their contributions have greatly enriched our society. Black History Month provides a platform to celebrate such inspiring stories while at the same time promoting understanding and respect. Moreover, it is an educational opportune moment where we enlighten ourselves and others about the significant contributions and impactful experiences of these and many other Black Canadians. Black history should not be confined to a mere myth. The narratives of Black Canadians like Jane Augustine and jazz legend Oscar Peterson are intricately woven into our nation's fabric, unfolding tales of triumph, resilience, creativity, and influence. By learning about and propagating these narratives, 
we celebrate civil rights activists like Carrie Best and also enhance our understanding of the myriad contributions made by this vibrant community. We must extend the dialogue beyond February, igniting meaningful conversations and fostering a deeper appreciation of diversity. Remembering and sharing the stories of icons like Portia White and Willie O'Ree, the first black player in the National Hockey League, is crucial for creating cultural connections. Together, let's honor the past, embrace the present, and shape a more inclusive future. Every time I wear this, people look at me and go, did you get your stuff? Uh, that's how good it works. I'm about to spell my secret that's given all of my... Not to hear about the latest... Um cosmetics here right okay then sorry about that back i am with you um so i i hope you you found that that interesting and um i thought it was kind of on me to share uh, robert you've made a point in the chat and you're going to make another point now yes i was just going to say that neuren's exhibition oh, is God, opening yeah. next week uh It'll be at Pontio this time. It'll be moving on later. Um, and this does celebrate the contribution of minority people in North Wales, historically and uh, for the, the present day, with uh, an exhibition of artwork by uh, minority populations and uh, films, interviews with some of the early uh, black pioneers in North Wales. I would suggest um, anybody wanting to see it, who presumably will not be living in uh, Jamaica, um, you should leave your visit until at least late next week, because we've had to pull out some material for a smaller exhibition uh, celebrating the work of Chinese people, which will be uh, on show in another part of the region. So later next week, everything should be in place. And there are some interviews filmed with some of the early or the early, the oldest <laughs> black residents in, in North Wales, some of whom are no longer, no longer alive. So I hope people who can get there will will really enjoy it. We've done our best. Fabulous. Are you having a launch? Is there a launch date? Because maybe Garrick could come down. I was just thinking, how long is it running for? If you give me the, the start and finish, I'll come over. Yeah, OK. Um, I can't give you the finish off the top of my head. Um, well, we can do not... by email. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. I will. Yeah. We're, we're not having an official launch. Um, because everything, our time scale was a bit compressed and we weren't sure whether we would be able to launch on time. So we didn't arrange a big event. But when we open in Wrexham, we hope that Charlotte Williams will uh, do the do the opening. That would be excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Robert, for, for mentioning that. And I know how much hard work and effort has gone in from the team who have been working on the preparation of this uh, exhibition, which is going to tour North Wales. So that, that's really great. Thank you ever so much, Robert. That's good. Robert's point in the um, uh, chat was about um, the fact that there's a great deal of similarity between Australian Black history and Canadian Black history. Uh, the big difference is, of course, that we didn't have that many um, African people brought to Australia enslaved, but, you know, not to miss out. They discovered that you could enslave people from um, the local, uh, from the islands in the Pacific and um, that was called blackbirding, based on the same ideas that would have been successfully used by the British in uh, the Caribbean and, and in America. And a number of people came to Australia, bringing with them 
the income that they received because of the um, emancipation of their the freedom of their slaves. So they're, they're complex but difficult histories and, and, well, and we don't want to overlook them. Here in Australia, we recognize black history, but we recognize it's a story of the history of the continent, um, not necessarily quite the same as black history in, in other countries, but we still, we still importantly recognize it. Thanks for that then, Robert, well, wonderful and, and great. Um, my bit of good news is that I am so excited and my granddaughter is totally perplexed because Anuka, Atinuka, has agreed to come and speak with us. Now, Atinuka has written the... <laughs> and I'll explain about my granddaughter. Atinuka has written the most brilliant book about um, black British history for children. It's big. I haven't got the copy with me now because I've lent it to somebody. It's a big book. It's beautifully illustrated and it is really, really comprehensive. Now, Anuka has received quite a lot of criticism in the press because she challenges the story of British people by pointing out that there have been Africans in Britain since goodness knows when. Um, but it is a super her book. Now, the reason that my granddaughter's perplexed is that Anuka, Atinuka, is um, Nigerian, um, living in Wales, and she writes a series called Anna Hibiscus, and also the number one car spotter, I think it's called. And my granddaughter, who's 10, absolutely adores these books introduced to her, I have to say, by the other granny, who's a real literary children's literature buff. Anyway, she's been buying these books of Atinukas and then Tilly's really, really enjoying them. And when I told Tilly that Atinuka was going to come and talk on the programme, she, she was sort of speechless. She couldn't believe that that you could ask an author to talk. And I think that today's session was wonderful because it was so good to have Maxine talking to us as a conversation, um, but but sharing with us as an author. And also, Rose, when you came and talked to us about the book you put together, I think for children there can be a bit big disconnect between these authors who seem, you know, inaccessible and uh, and and the books. So yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to that. So I think it's uh, April the twelfth. So what I would ask all of you, we try and get you a copy over to Jamaica, Vivian. Not sure how we'll manage that, but. Um, uh, it would be great if you could go to your local library and see if you can borrow it from there because that makes sure that your local library is stocking it. Um, but also, if some of you want to buy your own copy, it is absolutely worth, worth every penny. It's a really, really good book. So we've got some really interesting things coming up, most of which I can't remember at the moment, but I'll just quickly look on my list that I keep on the bottom of the website, um, the current website. So um, we've also got, um, oh, uh, wonderfully, on the 9th of February, I'm hoping that the Reverend um, Dr. De Devon Dick is going to come along and, and uh, talk to us. Um, he's in Jamaica. Thank you very much uh, to Dr. Vivian Crawford for arranging this. Um, uh, Reverend Dr. Devon Dick was a member of the Council Institute of Jamaica, President of the Baptist Assembly, Chairman of the National Jamaica National Heritage Trust, and she was going to, uh, and he, he is going to talk to us about about the church and um, uh, the relationship with with slavery. I'm not quite sure exactly what title he's going to choose. Vivian, as he said to you. No, no, no. But you are on the right track, please. Yeah. As usual. Yeah. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. And we've also got, um, uh, I'm just checking the chat again. Oh, Robert's giving me more information about uh, Australia. Hang on a minute. Let me just no, find, no, no, no. I have to get back to the 
thing I was reading from. Um, no, okay. I'm just asking for the title of the Akanuka book for children. Oh, right. Okay. I've got it here. Got it here for you, Foki Wokies. Um, let's just get here. Scru share screen. And it's called Brilliant Black History, British History by Atanuka. Can you see it? And um, its description is an eye-opening story about the history of Britain, focusing on part of our past that's mostly been left out of history books, Black British history, from science to sport to education and law, celebrate the hard work of brilliant Black people from different backgrounds to help to build Britain. Learn about key and complex historical topics such as world wars, slavery, industrial revolution, Windrush, Black Lives Matter. It's a really, really up-to-date book. This fascinating book will change everything you thought you knew about our green grey isles. Atinuka was born in Nigeria and moved to UK when she was a child. Her love was performing stories and she now pours her creative talents into writing children's books mentions Anna Hibiscus, B for Baby. That's a lovely little book for a baby. Long listed for a Kate Greenaway Award. And um, she's also uh, done a book called Africa, Amazing Africa, which I haven't seen. So if any of you can get a hold of a copy of that and share, um, that would be good as well. Um, and that won the 2020 School Library Association's Information Book Award which uh, inspired by the beautiful content of Africa um, and the illustrations by Kingsley Nebichi are absolutely superb. So um, so this is how I organise things. And um, Professor Hazel V. Carby, who's a universe, from Yale University, she's Welsh and written a book um, which uh, which is called Imperial Intimacies, A Tale of Two Islands. Um, and so she negotiates how the ancestral ties between the UK and Jamaica um, are intimately entangled by empire. Um, so uh, that'll be really interesting. And she's confirmed that she's going to be able to speak to us. We've been having endless conversations so quite a lot of exciting things coming up so let me know if there's any more ideas uh, Robert I'd got down here that I'd quite like to um, uh, um, have a presentation about your project if one of the team would like to join us one week and um, perhaps some photographs and perhaps we might be able to see some of the videos if that was possible anyway give it some thought Robert will you <laughs> okay all right then so anything else folks it's only 10 to 3 here. Just, just remind um, people, tomorrow's meeting, Liz. Oh, yes. What? Tell, tell, tell us, please. Cause yes, Roland's so we have the North Wales Jamaica Society first Saturday of the month, which is tomorrow. Yeah, and we also have um, Audrey Juji uh, joining yep. us at 2 o'clock again. Correct. And Audrey's going to speak about... Um, the Black History Research is done about North Wales and there are some really interesting things and this um, she's posted an article on um, David Gleave's um, historical I can't remember the rest Histories of the as, yeah, Historical Roots Historical, historical Roots, roots. Yeah. Historical Roots website mm -hmm. so uh, we're looking forward to her joining us and we'll also be sharing progress about how we're getting on with um, our application for support for the Pennant's community off the Pennant family, the Douglas Pennant Family Foundation, um, and also an update about what's happening with the tithe application. So that's that's promising to be quite an interesting session. So that should be good. Vivian? Just, sorry, just apology for absence for tomorrow. I have choir oh, yeah. practice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you have to speak to teacher Vivian. You have to speak to teacher if you can be absent. But have you got good reason to be absent tomorrow? 
Yeah. <laughs> if only two sessions this week, he can't do another one. <laughs> I'm a church organist. I'm a church organist. Uh, that's so, okay. Uh, yeah. I have choir practice. Yes, you can't be in uh, two places at the same time. It's okay. Yeah. Of course you can be. <laughs> in spirit, yes. In spirit and physical, yes. <laughs> well, we do a kind of a, a bit of an update on what so, was we were talking we about. Thank you, Liz, though. But, we uh, really want to you, thank you, Liz, for these, especially also for these presenters. It's yes. really wonderful. And oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh. whoa. <laughs> It really is remarkable. I'm so grateful to everyone. And it was lovely, Rose, for example, you were able to join us. And and so, you know, if anybody's got any other bright ideas, then the further ahead we can plan the programme, the better. Um, and certainly uh, there, are, there are people who we've overlooked in, uh, inviting in the past. Um, uh, June Elizabeth, you'll come back to me with some people, I'm sure, and, and Garrick, you as well. Um, What's his name from Wolverhampton? Um, you referring to um, um, Patrick Vernon? Patrick Vernon. We've yes. never invited yeah. Patrick. Yeah. Not formally. Yeah. Um, and I had something from the guy who's doing the University of Diversity online. I so I'd asked him to speak, but I haven't heard mm. back from him. And, and Lisa um, Lisa Anderson, yes, from Black Archive, Cultural Archives. Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah. So make sure that um, you know, I've got people's contact details and then then I'll I'll sort of formalize that planning arrangement better so you can see what's coming up. And that'll be something that'll be on the new website that it won't be kind of Sometimes we do it a week at a time. We don't know who's going to talk next week. <laughs> but anyway, it's been great. Lovely to see you all. Rose, do you want to tell us any more about your trip to Jamaica? Um, no, it, it was just fascinating. I, I w was able to to meet, um, to have a tour of the Up Park camp um, for the Jamaica Defence oh, yeah. Force. Yeah. And uh, the commanding officer was so lovely, you know, had a warm welcome and managed to see their their museum uh, would like to support, you know, more of the the work they're doing, if I can. Um, and I also, uh, I think as somebody you'd recommended, Liz, um, I also managed to meet the head of the Jamaican Legion. Um, I invited oh, wow. him uh, along as well. So it was it, it it was all just quite uh it was quite busy in lots of other ways because i had some family business to take care of so i was up and down you know this sort of notion of town and country you know you go to the country from kingston it's like a math the highway is great it's lovely don't get me wrong but you know um with juicy patty on the way but but actually <laughs> it was it was it, it, it i managed we managed to do some of those sloggy type um yeah. personal business stuff um yeah. so there were six of us um i met up with my brother and sister and their spouses who'd been down there three weeks ahead of me and my other sister and we we literally trundled back and forth you know and, uh, navigating negotiating with people who really don't want to buy bits <laughs> but you know want to take up our time to talk about about it and see if we can give it donate it to them uh and all that sort of thing but it, it was it was so interesting i love going um and i also went to theater um which was fantastic to see something called pig view heights at the courtly auditorium it, oh, um, yeah man, I, I hadn't realized there was quite so many trendy young jamaicans you know uh, doing the scene in terms of all these fancy restaurants that I didn't even know existed. And I'll have you all know that I managed to do the 5K run in Oak Gardens and surrounding area. Uh, I say run, well, you know, I was not, <laughs> it was not that fast. 128. Well, you completed it. You completed it. I have, I have a medal, I'll have you know. <laughs> A finisher's medal. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah, oh, it was really oh, when, interesting. When are you back? Back in Jamaica? Well, I'm hoping. Um, oh, I am I just have to think about it and um, think about how I can 
manage all the things I wanted because met some fantastic people would have loved to have you know met Vivian and 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 Jonathan and you know other people yeah. there but I managed to meet the chief librarian it was oh, um, good. Good. yeah that was a good uh, a good, good uh, contact and gave out very yes I did Liz take lots of books <laughs> and not that many clothes which is just fine um so I managed to give those out um to to many and various people and I would love to to do more when I when I go again Very I good. don't know exactly when but it would should be in a few months actually I hope to well, thank you very much again for supporting this session. And uh, it's really, really good. We're rolling along. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much, Vivian, for your wonderful contribution again today and really appreciate it. And, you know, really it, uh, thank you because you're making every effort to join every session you possibly can. And I really appreciate it. I know how hard it is. Thank you very much, June Elizabeth, for supporting it again. Uh, and also Garrick and uh, Roland joined us and Simon was here. And Robert, thank you. You know you were getting on with other things and you told us you were doing that and that's fine because it's a, a long session for, for folks to sit in front of a computer and not to do a few little checks of the email and whatever else you need to do yeah. okay then all the very best How everybody and um take care. we'll see you all again soon we'll see all you right thank you, Liz. Thank you. See you tomorrow yeah okay, okay. thanks, bye -bye. thanks. Bye. very much then thank bye. you bye then bye